secluded village of Debaget, I can't, I'm sorry, <laughs> other languages I struggle with, Debaget, uh, a Philippian island in the north, he was in this village of Luzon, and as he was a six-year-old boy, he was, of course, eager to see what was going on, and one particular day, a uh, man by the name of Ben, a tall, skinny white fellow, staggered into town. Well, his, his elders of his village came around and they questioned him, wondering what he was doing there in this secluded village. And he struggled to communicate with them with the language barrier that was between them. They tried to talk and communicate back and forth, and it was discovered that he was there to learn their language. You see, Ben Ray's purpose to be there was to learn the language of this tribe so that he could translate the Bible into their language and give them the Word of God in written form. Well, the elders were curious, and so they allowed him to stay, and over time they worked with him, teaching him their language. This was a tribe of headhunters, and so Ben was fortunate to be alive. And over time, he befriended many of them, drew them closer to him, and after about seven years, he had to go back to the U.S. to raise more money for his work. But as he was leaving, he left this boy, 13-year-old Nard, with a copy of the book of Mark that he had translated into his local tongue. Well, Nard sat down on a rock overlooking a valley. This big rock sat there with this gospel in his hand. And he began to read the Bible in his own language. And as he said, it became alive to him. And it was as if he could hear the people speaking, as if he could hear the disciples and Jesus. And he started to fall in love with this gospel of Mark. But as he read, there became a problem. You see, a group of people came and attacked Jesus. They took Jesus. You know the story of the crucifixion scene. <laughs> and Nard was very distraught by this. He thought to himself, how if this is the Son of God, how is it that God is not doing anything? And so he became angry and he noticed that hatred started to fill his heart and he threw down the book and began to walk off crying out, why couldn't you defend your son? Why would you let these people kill your son? And hatred filled up. And he said, I don't want to serve a God in which you would stand by and watch as the people killed your son. He thought to himself, our headhunters, they will defend our tribe to the death. Why wouldn't you step in? It was at this time that Nard hold, heard the Holy Spirit speaking to him. He said, it was because of my love for you that I let my son die. And so Nard went back and he picked up the book and he continued to read through the book of Mark only to discover that not only was Jesus killed, but that he rose again. Nard fell in love with the gospel. You see, the gods that he knew before, the spirits that he knew, the headhunters that he knew, none of them had ever raised from the dead before. And oh, what a powerful thing this was. And he couldn't imagine anything better. See, all too often we think of the gospel and we think of Jesus and his sacrifice, but we forget the Father and his sacrifice. A lot of times we think of Jesus and oh what an important sacrifice it was. But all too often we forget the Father and what he gave up. I want to read to you from the book of Zechariah chapter 4. If you'll turn with me there. Zechariah right near the end of the Old Testament. Zechariah chapter 4. And I want to read part of verse 6 to you. It says, Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, it says, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. You see, 
Nard here was led to the truth of Mark by the Holy Spirit, and in turn, we are only led to truth by the Holy Spirit. Now I'm going to let you in on a little something, and I know some of you weren't here last week, but of course we were talking about the doctrine of Christian behavior. We were talking about how God comes into us as vessels and molds us and shapes us and changes our character to be like Him. This is part two of that sermon. However, you don't really need to hear part one to know what's going on in this sermon, so you're okay. But if you want, you can go back, and I'm sure you can find it on our website and listen to the sermon. And if not, maybe in the next couple of days, it'll be up there. But uh, this week, of course, we are again talking about Christian behavior, a very important aspect of the gospel, a very important aspect of how God works in us. You'll remember that the Bible says that God leaves nothing old, right? He changes us and creates all things new. In Zechariah here, it says, not by might nor by spirit, not, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. We can't use our might, we can't use our strength to defend the gospel. We can't use our strength to make the gospel real in us. It is only by the Holy Spirit working in us that the gospel becomes real. And so I want to go back to our text from last week and look at it again and just see if this new helps us to understand this in a new way. Let's go to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Let me know when you're there. It says, I beseech you, therefore, <laughs> brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You see, God has a plan for us to, to live by His will, to do as He asks. But if we don't understand who God is, we will have no real desire to do what He asks. I thought long and hard about this this week because there is a separation in our country. There is a separation in our world. There is a separation in our church of two things. There is a separation between those who are aware and those who are unaware of what the Father did. You see, the reality is, is when we become aware of what God really did for us, it does something inside of us. It changes us. And only when that happens do we really become the Christians that God wants us to be. Without that change, without that understanding, we are missing the big picture. And so we have to understand what the Father did for us. I don't know about you, but this is a topic for me that's very hard to grasp. But I have a little more insight as a father now, as a parent. I look at my children, I look at my three beautiful girls whom I love, I, I see them, I was hoping they'd be here today, so I, but then Courtney informed me they were going to be at, at uh, Salisbury, uh, she had promised a friend she would be there today, and so they're not here, but uh, my beautiful girls, I think about them, and I think about how the longer I'm with them, the more I love them. I still remember the very first time I looked Ella in the eyes and held her, the very first time, never being a parent before, I picked up this child, and the love that filled me was unreal. It brought me to tears. I thought, wow. <clears throat> I never held her before. I never had a child before. I didn't have a connection with her. Of course, she was in Courtney, and so Courtney had that connection. But, but I never had touched her or seen her or hold her. And as soon as I saw her, as soon as I picked her up, I felt this tremendous love for my daughter that is indescribable. I feel that same love, of course, for my other girls. But the amazing thing is, although I love them so much when they were born, I love them even more today. 
And every time I see my girls and my family sitting around the supper table, I think of how proud I am to have these beautiful children that I love. Amen. And then I think of the Father. I spent some time praying over this, writing in my prayer journal this week, and I was asking God, I said, God, help me to understand the love of the Father. Help me to understand what I'm missing, what maybe we're missing. Help me to grasp this. And I'm writing down, and I'm writing to God, and I'm thinking about this. I'm thinking about my children and my love for them, and if I could ever sacrifice them. And then I thought about this. So the longer I'm with my children, the more I love them. Even if they discourage, if they're discouraged, if they challenge me. I remember one time this past summer, Ella told me, she was mad, she yelled at me, said, I don't even love you. And oh, how that hurts. But you know what? I still love her. And I still love her more. And so here is the Father. Here is the God of the universe who is bound in the Trinity through all eternity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they're together through all eternity. The Father and the Son and the Spirit all together through all eternity in love that's perfect, is complete and whole, and, and yet they're together through all eternity. Can you imagine the love that is between those three? It's beyond our understanding. If I could rarely, I could not even imagine taking my daughter and giving her to someone else or sacrificing my child. Yet here is the God through all eternity that was new and grew with the one that he loved, his son. He took that son who he'd been with through all eternity. And he created us. And then we sinned, but he said, I will be willing to sacrifice this son that I love more than anything. This son who I've been with for all eternity. This son who my love is completed in. This son. And I will give him to you. And then Jesus comes down to this earth and he lives for us. And he lives this life where he does no wrong. He's good to everyone. And what happens? These people take him and they beat him and they crucify him. The God of the universe gave up his son to that kind of torment, to the place where his son cried out from the cross, Father, why have you forsaken me? What a love. He lost his own son for you. A tiny little ant on some faraway planet who he still loves enough to give his son. And it's that love that changes everything. You see, what happens is when we recognize what the Father did, we become unendingly grateful. If you realize what he did for you, you are grateful. You know what gratefulness does? It brings about thankfulness. And gratefulness brings about thankfulness, and thankfulness brings about joy. And if you're a sad Christian, if you're an angry Christian, you must not know the Father. Because what He did for you can do nothing but bring about joy in your life. Amen. And if you don't have that joy, you plead with God. I want to know what you gave up for me, Jesus. What you gave up for me, Father God. You see, it is that sacrifice that shows how great a love the Father has for you. And I can't help now but read from John chapter 3. Go with me there. John chapter 3, verse 16. There is, there is not much in a more appropriate verse. John chapter 3, verse 16. And I can't read that without verse 17. For God so loved the world. Did you hear that? For the Father... So loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The father sacrificed his son who he loved perfectly and unendingly and completely. He gave up his son. To die so that you could have life. And that should be gratefulness in your heart. We're in this time of thanksgiving, a time in which the world has forgotten about what it means to be thankful. 
My father-in-law and I had to go to Walmart to pick some up for the meal for Thanksgiving that was forgotten. I think it might have been vegan ice cream, but I don't remember. <laughs> but anyway, so we went to Walmart for that. We came out of the store and we were driving back. And I think it was three or four in the afternoon on, on Thanksgiving. And we drove past the Belk in Elmamarle. And there was a line all the way down the store and then all the way down the other side of the store. It was probably two football fields long. And if you can imagine, here they are at 4 o'clock in the afternoon on Thanksgiving, a day that's said to be thankful for what we have, waiting in line to get more stuff. And this is where our world is at. We are so rushed to get more stuff that we can't even be thankful for what we have. We have invaded a day that's supposed to be for thankfulness for more merchandise. Next thing you know, a couple years down the road, they might not even have Thanksgiving anymore. It might just be Black Thursday. Yeah. Right? But we live in a world where we've forgotten how to be thankful. But when you think about what God the Father did for us, how can you help but be thankful? When you think of that thankfulness, when you think of that with the gratitude that comes with knowing what the Father was willing to sacrifice for you, how could you not have joy in your heart? And what happens is when you recognize what God did, He transforms you because of that gratitude. And you do the things that He asks, not out of, out of service or out of legalism or out of because I have to, but you do it out of Love because you're thankful. And so I want to say today, church, that it is our call from God that we look at God's sacrifice with gratitude and be thankful. Because when we are thankful, we will be transformed. Are you with me? John chapter 4, 1 John, sorry, 1 John chapter 4, right before the book of Revelation, 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. You get to Peter and just keep going. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 18. What a beautiful chapter this is. If you want to know about God's love, this is the chapter for you. Um, but verse 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. You see, what happens is we as, as people, we have this natural sinful instinct to self-preserve, don't we? Yeah. We want to take care of ourselves. We want to worry about ourselves. It's the same reason we quit being thankful and run to the store to get more stuff because we're worried about ourselves. And you know what that comes from? It comes from fear. See, if we don't have enough stuff, our kids won't be happy, or our cousins won't be happy, or our loved one won't be happy, and we are filled with fear. But real love casts out fear. You see, when we understand what God did for us, there's no fear. And instead of worrying about ourselves, instead of worrying about what we have, instead of worrying about the things that we want to do, we'll worry about what God wants for us. You see, when we understand God's love, it changes everything. And we no longer have fear because we then have a God of love living in us. And we become transformed. Understanding God's sacrifice brings gratitude. Are you grateful? 1 Samuel chapter 16, 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7. This chapter is an interesting chapter. It talks about uh, the anointing of the new king and Samuel is told to go to Jesse's family, uh, the Benjaminite. And he is told to go and, or sorry, the Bethlehemite. He's told to go and, and to make a new king, to anoint a new king. And so he goes before Jesse's family and he goes... And, and, and Samuel is waiting to, to see who God chooses, who he should anoint, who he should be told to make 
king. And this is a telling story of how we should be as Christians. You see, what happens here is he goes by the first one, and God says something. Verse 7, let's go there. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance. Isn't that what we worry about? Yes. Don't look at his appearance or at his physical stature. Don't worry if he looks like the greatest Christian in the world. He might not be. Don't look at his physical appearance or his stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance. But the Lord looks where? At the heart. Amen. You see, we make our selections. We vote for people. We look at people who we want to be friends with. We make that decision based on outward appearance. But God looks at the heart. Amen. And when we invite God into our heart and He lives there and He works on us and He changes us and He transforms us, we become different people. And it's interesting, if you were to keep reading, you would find that David comes before him and he says, then, and this is verse 22, then Saul sent to Jesse, or sorry, no earlier than that, I'm in the wrong spot. Okay, then Samuel took the horn and anointed um, and anointed him in the midst of his brothers in the spirit, this is verse 13, of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. But you'll notice if you look even earlier that he was bright eyed and good looking, right? So not he, he, was, he was an appealing to the eyes man, but God didn't care about that, did he? God cared about David's Heart. We learn later in Scripture that David was a man after God's own heart. This is what God wants for us. And if we want to be who He wants us to be, if we want to be a people of the book, if we want to be faithful to Scripture, if we want to follow the teachings in there, yes, there are plenty of teachings about how a Christian should behave, how a Christian should act, but none of that stuff is going to be any relevance if your heart's not changed. You can take all the things you want out of your life and you're not going to be a bit holier if you don't know Jesus. If you don't connect with the Father, if you don't know His Son, if the Holy Spirit is not living in you, you can be the holiest person in the church, but you ain't going to be in heaven. If you don't have Jesus in your heart, you got issues. Micah chapter 6. Let's go there. Micah chapter 6 from our scripture text of the day. Micah chapter 6. I actually said to, to Michael Leopard, I was like, we should have had Micah read this today. <laughs> Micah chapter 6. We're going to look at verse uh, 6 through 8 here. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with a calf, a year old? In other words, shall I bring this sacrifice? But then it goes on. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for tra my transgressions, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? In other words, Micah here, he said, what can I do, God? How can I make this right? What can I bring? Can I bring everything? But then in verse 8, it beautifully sums it up. He, he has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? Does he require sacrifice and rivers of oil? No, he says, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? Amen. This is a verse about Christian behavior, my friend. We should have God's character built in us, changing us. That we look at things justly and love mercy and walk humbly. This is the description of someone that's not selfish, is it? This is the description of a person that's like Jesus Christ. Amen. You see, here we have this dichotomy, this, this tension. Should I do what's right? Well, of course you should, right? <laughs> But if our motives behind doing what's right aren't right, is it right? No, no right? That's, that's where we come up with these Pharisees or hypocrites or legalism, you know. 
people like me, I guess you could say. But this is, this is where we come up with what's wrong, and we're doing what is right for the wrong reasons. We have to do what's right because God lives in us and is changing us and is motivating us to do what's right. Amen. And only when God is in your heart will you do justly and love mercy and walk humbly. Because I'll tell you, without God in my life, I'm not very humble. I remember my wife telling me that. I remember my wife specifically saying, you know, you're a little bit conceited. <laughs> and then, but that's the reality is when we're not transformed by God, we're worried about ourselves. And what was I doing? I was propping myself up. But I got, I've got news for you, friends. It's not about me. And it sure ain't about you. Who's it about? Jesus. Jesus, that's right. The God of love, the God of mercy. Turn with me now to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. <coughs> Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 to 17. We're going to read a little portion of scripture here to get here, and you can follow along with me, please. Chapter 3, verse 12 to 17. Therefore, as the what? The elect of God. This is God's people who he's working on, who he's changing. This is God's people who have God in their hearts. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercy, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. This is not people who jump to judgment. This is not people who chase people out of the church because they're not good enough. This is people of love, isn't it? This is a people of love. This is God's people of love. Who did Jesus hang out with? Did he hang out with the perfect people? No, he hang out with the broken people, right? He hung out with people like you and me. Then it says, forgiving one another as Christ forgave, even as Christ forgave you, so you must do. Verse 14, but above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Without love, we can't be like God. Without love, we, we're not kind to people. We're not just. We're not merciful. Without love, we're just angry Christians, right? Ain't nobody want to be around angry Christians. <laughs> then it says, and let the peace, or sorry, which is born in perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. And lift each other up. Lift each other up, admonishing one another. In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Can you sing a joyful song when you're ungrateful? No, but when you're grateful to God, praise comes out, doesn't it? I don't know how many times I'm sitting there doing my devotions, digging in the Word of God, and I see something that just strikes a chord of love in my heart, and what do I do? I break out in singing. And I'm glad nobody else is around to hear it, but I break out in singing. Why? Because my heart is joyful because of what God has done for me. When you fall in love with Jesus, you can't help but sing. Because your heart is filled with the love of the Father and the love of the Son and the love of the Holy Spirit. Then it goes on, verse 17. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Give thanks to God, the Father, through Him. So do the deeds, do them, but do them through Jesus, do them through His grace, through His love, through His mercy. Why? Because if you look at those parables of the servants, the one that's cast away, you didn't want to be like that guy. Why? Because he wasn't merciful and he wasn't gracious. You think about the, the parable of the guy who, the unforgiving servant, right? And he's forgiven so much. And then what does he do to his buddy that owes him money? He treats him poorly, right? Is that Christian behavior? No. When we have God's love in our hearts, we see what God has done for us and how there's no way we can ever repay such a debt. No way we can ever repay what God has done for us. And so we're merciful and gracious and loving and compassionate. Amen. And when people see that love that they so desperately need, they will want to be like Jesus too. Let's go to our last scriptures for the day, Ephesians. Chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 to 8. Ephesians chapter 2, 
verse 4 to 8. Are you ready for this? Amen. For by grace, by what? By grace you have been saved. That means you didn't deserve to be saved. Did, did you or I deserve to have the Son of God come down here and die for you? Of course not. The only reason we're saved is because of God's love. So for by grace you are saved through faith. And that not of yourself, not of what you're doing, not of your works, not of how awesome you look as a Christian. That's not what saves you. It is the what? Gift of God. The gift of God. I, read, I jumped right to verse 8. Look at that. <laughs> we'll go back to verse 4. But God, I just wanted to get into it, right? You saw it. <laughs> but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love Amen. with which he loved us. So God who's rich in mercy, his great love for us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Amen. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the age to come he might show the excellent riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Now I'll read verse 8 again. For by grace you were saved through faith and what? Not of yourself. It is the gift of God. The gift of God. You were saved not because of how perfect you are, not because of all the good things you do. You were saved by grace. And because of that grace, you should be grateful, shouldn't you? And when you're graceful, you want to do what's right. You want to be who God wants you to be. Church, I don't know about you, but I want to be who God wants me to be. I want to walk the way that God wants me to walk. And the only way I can do that is through His grace and mercy and love. Let's pray. Amen. Heavenly Father.